birth of the vibrator, with the roadway problem solved, Brand tackled the ongoing dilemma of getting bulky, expensive motors into very small car bodies. His solution was quite simply ingenious. Brand designed his own motor using a common door buzzer, the vibrator motor. It was small enough to fit in a chassis less than two inches long. Brand got little encouragement from Jack Goyland, who declared, you'll never make a door buzzer run around a track. But the defiant Anglo-Californian did just that. Brand's motor is a model of simplicity. An upright coil of wire becomes an electromagnet when electricity flows through it. The design places a flat metal actuator reed across the top of the coil. When the coil is magnetized by electricity, the actuator reed pulls towards the coil and ratchets the drive gear mounted on the car's rear axle. At the same time, the reed also forces down a rod passing through the coil. The downward motion of the rod pushes the rear end of the electrical pickup shoe away from the bottom of the coil, momentarily breaking electrical contact and demagnetizing the coil. The actuator reed then springs back up, and at the bottom of the coil, the metal contact shoe does the same thing, re-establishing contact with the coil. This sends current through the coil once again, and the whole process starts anew, with 16 volts of alternating current flowing through the system. The process is repeated many times per second, sending the car literally buzzing down Brand's track. Highways, the first HO slot car set. Carl Robinette knew he had a winner with Derek Brand's ingenious miniaturized car system. He began shopping the concept around in numerous toy companies. Finally cutting a deal with British toy maker Met Toy, builder of Corgi diecast cars. Metoid represented a situation similar to that of the Polk brothers. Low British tooling and production costs underwriting the launch of a questionable new product. Robinette retained ownership of the tooling, leasing it to Metoy. With great fanfare, Metoy's playcraft division unveiled Highway's road transport system at the 1959 Brighton Toy Fair. Unfortunately, most English toy and hobby distributors were unimpressed. Highways arrived on the scene shortly after Scalectric, and it would never achieve the popularity in Great Britain that the larger-scale systems would. During the fair, glum playcraft marketeers received a visit from Abe Shikes and Joe Giamarino of Aurora. Since playcraft distributed Aurora plastic model kits in Great Britain, Shikes and Giamarino were expected. The two Americans surveyed the miniature car system and were surprised and delighted. Abe Sykes discovered Derek Brand lurking behind a curtain, like the Wizard of Oz operating the controls of his slot car layout. He turned it on, and I couldn't believe something so small could have a motor inside. I picked one up and put it down in a hurry. It was hot. Whenever anybody would come in to watch the cars, this playcraft guy would wet his fingers before picking up a car. He was cooling them off. Playcraft had just 12 hand-built prototype cars, specially built by Brand. Only four would go into production. The Jaguar XK140, Mercedes 3000 SL, Mac Lorry, and to please the anticipated American market, 1958 Chevrolet Impala, numbers 3101 through 3104. Speed controllers were green painted metal with working ignition keys and tiny steering wheels operating the rheostats. Brand's vibrator motors can endure 150 to 200 hours of operation without breakdown. Previously, he'd run numerous home tests, setting up a highway systems on his dining room table and letting cars run while he watched television. Interference on his TV screen reminded Brand that his tiny motors were still humming away. Although Carl Robinette had taken his slot car concept to Great Britain first, he always intended to market his product in the United States. However, when Abe Sykes and Joe Giamarino asked Robinette for an American license, he refused, saying Aurora wasn't large enough to handle the anticipated high volume. Robinette returned to the U.S. after Brighton and tried to sell highways to a number of the big American toy manufacturers, including Mattel and A.C. Gilbert, but found no takers. Only then, and only after much persuasion by Sykes, did Robinette agree to license his car system to Aurora? Launching HO in the States. 
Aurora introduced highways to the American hobby industry in January 1960 at the Hobby Industry Association of America show in Chicago. Aurora's suite provided prime display space for two basic layouts. One, a simple oval. The other integrated into an HO train layout to demonstrate compatibility. Hobby shop distributors and big chain store buyers loved it. Moreover, the children of industry leaders went crazy over it. However, not exactly as Sykes and Gio Marino had intended, kids raced the oval track car so fast they spun out. The HO train system provided interest only in its potential for car and train wrecks. When H I A A ended, Sylvan Sidney, editor of the Trade Journal, Craft Model and Hobby Industry, wrote, I may be wrong, but the most exciting new product displayed at the Chicago show was Aurora's Highways, an HO scale highway system that can be used in conjunction with HO trains or used as highway racetrack. Aurora took out a full-page ad in the March 1960 toy industry journal, Playthings. An unbelievable new product is destined to take place among the best-selling items of all time, a claim that proved prophetic. Back in West Hempstead, frenzied activity filled Aurora executive offices. The first issue to be resolved was the question of how the product would be marketed. Robinette and some Aurora staff thought it best to emphasize the HO automobiles as an add-on to model train layouts. Aurora's hyperactive advertising manager, Donald Bill Silverstein, led the faction that wanted to pinch slot cars as racers. Backed by Joe G. and Marino, Bill Silverstein won the day. Advertising and packaging would show racing scenes with an insert depicting the HO railroading tie-in. Silverstein prevailed on another point as well. The highway's name was dropped after being deemed inappropriate for a racing set. The name that would come to define the toy segment, Model Motoring, was born. Tooling up. Aurora's next hurdle was production. The items displayed at HIAA were either borrowed from Playcraft or hand-built prototypes. Aurora had taken orders for tens of thousands of sets and promised September delivery, but had yet to produce their very first car or section of track, and the clock was ticking. Craftco's lease tooling was immediately shipped from Metoy to the United States, but was declared unsuitable by Aurora's perfectionist chief engineer, Joe Giamarino. Aurora production chief Frank Carver remembers being called into Giamarino's office and told that Aurora would have to cut its own tooling as well as set up the whole manufacturing and assembly apparatus. We'll give it a shot, replied the overwhelmed Carver. The Aurora workday stretched from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m., and into the weekend. Joe Giamarino labored around the clock, taking catnaps in his office and living on a black coffee. He remembers it as quite a push. Aurora chief machinist Victor Kowalski re-engineered the Craftco diecast chassis tool. His design was so good that Aurora's version was exported to Great Britain for use by Playcraft, which explains why period examples of Playcraft cars are found today with two chassis variations. Aurora cut body tools with four cavities to quadruple production. Gio Marino and Carver set up the assembly line. 30 Aurora workers were trained to bring slot car components together seamlessly. Near the end of the line, assembled cars were placed on electrified track and zipped to final packaging. West Hempstead's firm's Herculean effort paid off. By September, Aurora began shipping the first of what would become 100,000 sets to department stores and hobby distributors. It was the beginning of something very big. Television, Aurora's best friend. Slot cars was still an entirely new concept to mainstream American toy consumers. Model trains, yes. Mechanical cars, of course. But electrical cars racing around plastic roadways? To build consumer awareness for the new Aurora product line, Silverstein initiated advertising campaigns in popular national magazines. His reason for magazines, adult buyers would see Aurora's promotional efforts and respond at Christmas with racing sets for their children. A full-page piece in the November 3rd New York Times said it all, the most exciting new hobby sport since electric trains. More important, Silverstein caught the imagination of popular TV personalities with Aurora's Tory racers. Carl Robinette had been right about one thing, Aurora couldn't afford TV advertising. Bill Silverstein didn't let that stop him. He actually charmed free time out of the networks. Dave Garraway, avid car buff and host of NBC's Today, invited Silverstein to a 10-lap figure-eight race in his NBC offices. 
Garraway won. Two days later, the newly confirmed slot car enthusiast devoted 10 minutes on today to races between himself and world-class Grand Prix racers Sterling Moss, Oliver Gendenbein, and Joaquin Bonnier. Later that month, Aurora slot cars appeared on the Jack Parr show. Perhaps most significant was the fact that each of these programs targeted adult viewers. Silverstein knew Aurora sets would be purchased by adults, and his entire market program, print, television, and public events, focused on this most important demographic group. Ensnare the parents went Aurora's logic, and purchase price would never be a problem. Product launch, sort of. Aurora introduced model motoring in the fall of 1960 with four sets. The 1502 set at 1695, the 1503 set at 2495, and two uncatalogued sets, one of which sold for only 1095. Aurora production chief Frank Carver, it hit the market and went right off the shelves. Nobody had ever seen anything like it before. Hobby shop consumers fought over sets and telephone stores 30 miles away to reserve a set. Bill Silverstein declared it was the biggest Christmas gift at the time. Slot cars, of course, were an entirely new product, and many buyers had little idea what they were purchasing. December 26, 1960 brought the point home for Aurora. It was a day of complete pandemonium at the West Hempstead factory. Silverstein recalled there was a tremendous line of people outside the front doors clamoring to get in. Their cry, this damn car won't run. Will you please sell me two more?